Hello and welcome to The Last Standy, a board game podcast. Hello! Hello and wall. Ah, it's not easy. <laughs> a board game podcast. Hello! Hello and wall. Ah, it's not easy. <laughs> I'm going to get through this intro someday. Hello and welcome to The Last Standy, a board game podcast coming to you from several thrilling countries across Europe. I am joined here today by Audrey. Hi, everyone! Across Europe. I am joined here today by Audrey. Hi everyone. Cara. Hello. Alessio. Hello. And I am your host, answer your name here. Today, we have three exciting topics for you. But first, let's, ca <laughs> let's catch up with everyone. Um, Audrey, how have you been doing recently? <laughs> Hello, insert your name here, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> Audrey, how have you been doing recently? Pretty fine. I had my sister that visited a few weeks ago and proved a grand opening of expert board games. Uh, <laughs> we played uh, together. What did we play together? Wait, we, we played a few smaller games, uh, like we played some Calico, uh, and my cat tried to eat some of the tokens. Uh, we played uh, Terraforming Mars, two games. Uh, and one or two other games that I'm not sure I remember which ones we did. Uh, but that was uh, really nice uh, because, yeah, we are part of quite a few uh, French, uh, let's say, Facebook uh, communities. Not exactly together, that was not intended, but we are both. And, yeah, that was just nice to, uh, let's say, have an extended share of uh, the hobby. And so she she was really happy, and she was the one asking to do another um, game of uh, Terraforming Mars. So that I was really happy. Uh, meanwhile, what a few other things happened, but that's more on my parents' side because they went back home uh, last time with a box of unlock, and actually we had the rule book of Romeo and Juliet inside. Don't ask me how it got there. <laughs> So they shipped it back to me, uh, and I got the letter like two days ago. Um, so that's not uh, a big deal, but that was still funny. And they tried playing Unlock together, uh, just my two parents and also with my sister, and they completely messed up everything. They were uh, going ahead of the mechanics, uh, having cards they had no idea where they came from, <laughs> etc. <laughs> that was a bit messy, but uh, where they came from, <laughs> etc. That was a bit messy, but. Um, I will say that sometimes uh, likely to happen in some unlock scenarios. Uh, some are, are very confusing, so that's that's a bit fair. You you started off light, but you got fair. You you started off light, but you got heavy pretty soon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so that's, I think, yeah, that's all for me. Um, yeah, that's it. What about you, Alessio? What's up? Oh, how nice to you. <laughs> okay. Um, actually, I, I am pretty busy at work these days. So uh, uh, I work with programming in a very delicate environment where people go to certification in summer so summer is a terrible day for me anyway uh, i checked a lot of uh, news these days i think the spiel des Jahres nominees just came out actually when we are recording but probably when the episode goes live they are basically being decided and there is a lot of... Uh, it's the first time I see a nominee for the Spiel des Jahres, which is a Hoink game. There's Scout, which is a great Hoink game, actually. A climbing car game. I love it, so I'm actually voting for that. <laughs> actually, I, I, I'm campaigning for it. Uh, and I think that uh, we could say that when the episode goes live, the ARCS campaign uh, will be over. ARCS is the next game from Leather Games, designed by Cold World. And uh, this one got a few bumps on the road. So this is uh, other news uh, you could check. This or about fun, uh, fun mind uh, communities and stuff uh, 
in uh, an upcoming episode, so I'll just leave it like that. I got Crescent Moon, which is a great game, and uh, it's a 4 to 5 player, player count, but it's great. It, it reminds me a lot of Chaos in the Old World, so that's a big, big plus for this game. And finally, I also got Cryptid, because, uh, but, well, actually it happened that uh, I like, I happen to like Cryptid, but I never got it. Urban Legends, which I don't like a lot, unfortunately. Uh, a lot of stores got uh, a promotion for Cryptid, and I used it to snatch it. I can see that uh, actually it's on discount basically worldwide these days, so probably uh, so probably uh, that's a recommendation if you happen to get it on discount. Cryptid, the base Cryptid, is a great deduction game. And I think that's all from me. Pretty boring. So what have you been up to, Kara? Um, Pretty boring. So what have you been up to, Kara? Um, well, I... I'm not sure. So I played um, <laughs> a, a lot of X-Wing, X actually, and um, kind of... How's going with the X-Wing community? Yeah. Kind of... How's going with the X-Wing community? Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> which was fun. And uh, like on, uh, two days ago, I actually won a game. So Ooh. that's nice. Ooh. Congratulations. Thank That's Thank an you. important step. Yeah. <laughs> um, apart from that, I played several games, um, which I can't really remember right now. I know Ten Garden was one of them, um, a game we will likely talk about sometime in this podcast. Um, and well, yeah. At least I, I, I think I, I'd like to talk. Remember that I would be very happy to hear you. Talk. Nothing could beat uh, could beat your Storm Weavers review anyway. <laughs> <laughs> oh right, I have to I have to 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 replay Storm Weavers and and give a, a second <laughs> um, chance opinion um, opinion. Um, yeah, and I plan on learning on Mars like tomorrow. Um, I, I skimmed the rule book, and oh my god, this this might take a while. Yeah, ah. good luck with that. <laughs> is is this your first? Yeah, ah. good luck with that. <laughs> is is this your first uh, Lost yes. Order game? So I will be very 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 interested in what uh, comes out of uh, that game because uh, this is the only Lost Order games that uh, the theme uh, talks to me. And people were like, yeah, pick the Garys. And people were like, yeah, pick the Garys. And yeah, but I, I no. And uh, on Mars just keeps uh, talking to me. And I'm like, yeah. So I will be very interested uh, interested to hear. Yeah, about it's, it. uh, I mean, I, 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 I'm not worried that I won't be able to learn the rules. But I have to give it a try with me because it feels like a lot of rules explanation before we can start and a lot of questions during play but um... that's uh, that's part of the game with the Lacerda games <laughs> yes <laughs> get vinos if you want uh, easy easy uh, air quotes uh, Lacerda but i don't like wine either <laughs> i actually no, specifically you... got on mars because of all the Lacerda games it has the highest complexity rating on board game geek um, <laughs> and i have this little masochistic um, strain in me, but um, <laughs> yeah. So, looking forward, to, looking forward to that. <laughs> yeah, me too. Yeah, yeah me too. Yeah, I, I reserve my judgment for when uh, a, a bit more people played. Mm. Yeah. So anyway, um, who are we missing? Alexis. Yes, we are. We are missing. Enter your name here. Um, We're missing Alexis. Yes, we are. We are missing. Enter your name here. Um, <laughs> uh, I've been very busy with work uh, recently, and unfortunately, unable to to attend the podcast for the last uh, three or four episodes. Uh, but I'm glad to be back. Um, recently, I've been well. Recently, with within this recently, I've been well. Recently, with within this week, I've been playing a lot of Mysterium with um, 
I'm in vacation at the moment and I've seen uh, um, some, uh, we, we were seeing some friends and uh, Mysterium is just such a, a nice and easy game to, to pull out and, uh, and play for a while. I played also a lot of the uh, phone application of, um, sorry. Uh, you were in impurities, Alessio? Uh, is that on everybody's okay. end? Is I it just Alessio that... that is hearing Will? Ah, uh, fuck. Uh, just my eyes, I, mean, I don't know. It's fine because my recording is, uh, is going, like, on this end and it doesn't seem to be anything weird going on, so I'll just, I'll just chuck it as, um, Yeah, that, that, that's I'll okay. Fix... I can fix it in pod, uh, in post. That's fine. It's not bad, okay. but it's annoying. I unfortunately I won't fix it for your hands, but I'll fix I'll fix it for um, listeners. Uh, Everyone's so. end, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, get back to it. Um, yes, I've played a bit of the wavelength uh, phone app. Uh, yes, I've played a bit of the wavelength uh, phone app. Uh, which is basically just a phone version of the Wavelength game that I've uh, raved about last year. Uh, and I am happy to report that the phone app works extremely well. Uh, there's a free version that has just, um, I think a dozen or so questions to allow you to, um, I think a dozen or so questions to allow you to, to try out if the game works well. And then you can, I think you can pay, uh, I think it's five euros to get the whole packs of the game. Uh, and you can easily, it's basically functions like a Jackbox party pack where you can join a room that you functions like a Jackbox party pack where you can join a room that you host on your phone. And so you can play with it, even the same room, either in the same room or through uh, discord or something. It works really well. Uh, I've had a lot of fun with it and I would recommend everybody to check it as a good, uh, board game app. Um, yeah, you, you know, that could be game app. Um, yeah, you you know that yeah. could be really interesting because uh, uh, a part of the appeal of wavelength is actually be on the same wavelength with other people. So playing it online could be really fun. <laughs> I guess interesting. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, finally, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I had a really good game of uh, ultraviolet grassland. Uh, tabletop game that we talked about in one of our earlier episodes. Uh, maybe if I'm smart enough during the editing, I might add which episode it was. Otherwise, you're <laughs> welcome to just um, scout. It was a very fun first game with three completely uh, strange and different characters. Um, and I'm looking forward to play more of it. Uh, I am should be I should play that uh, just uh, this week, actually. So... Uh, crossing fingers that everything will go great. Wastelands. Sorry. Uh, did you say ultraviolet wastelands? Gracelands, uh, like a grassland. Uh, gra like oh, oh, okay, energy. okay, okay. Anyway, I'm getting old because I don't remember that episode. <laughs> could be an episode where I wasn't in, so could that, be. <laughs> that is possible. That's um, a tabletop game. A very. Um, it has some uh, very Mobius, uh, Dune-y um, themes cool. and aesthetics. It looks really fun. Uh, Rule-wise, it's pretty, uh, it's on the lighter side, but it has a lot of um, really interesting uh, inspiration. Technically, it's more about the exploration and the discovery of the world than it is about combat specifically. Um, and so the, the rule book, for example, is all about those very different and strange locations all around the world that you can you can explore as the game is kind of uh, based on those ideas of the um, early 17th century. Uh, the idea that you had just like mm. this far away destination wow. that you wanted to, to go to, uh, towards with uh, riches uh, at the end, but a lot of, um, you know, a lot of hardship in the in the making and just making the, the, the way there uh writing down the way uh discovering new uh trade routes that kind of stuff all of that what was um reward enough before um you know it, it wasn't about it, it's not exactly an rpg about combat or, or anything but it's very 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 fun uh but i will uh, i will report more on that in like maybe 30 minutes for me to explain the uh it's a little bit more in detail but um for now 
Uh, I think yep. that we can start talking about a game that Kara wanted to talk about. Uh, speaking of psychedelic uh, metal, uh, there's nothing more metal than a horse with a horn on its head. Uh, we were to, we nothing more metal than a horse with a horn on its head. Uh, we were to, we are going to talk about unstable unicorns. Yeah, um, for starters. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, 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 well kept secret about myself. I really love unicorns, and um, so uh, really love unicorns, and. Um, so uh, someday I stumbled upon this uh, Kickstarter, Unstable Unicorns, and I thought, oh my god, that's a game for me. So I, I, of course I got it. And um, it's by uh, Raimi Baddy or so, and um, um, published by Unstable Games. It was their first game in 2017. And um, and I got it, and I looked at it, and it's just, it's, it's beautiful, you know, it's a uh, style uh, which is really cute and, and uh, colorful, and um, it's just really funny. And then I got to play it, and the problem is, basically, the, the art is the opinion oh that's uh... great this is another star weavers review yeah <laughs> <laughs> so um quickly about the game um it's a card game um you start um by um everyone gets like one starter unicorn by, um everyone gets like one starter unicorn it's a baby unicorn you start with and um then uh, you get, I think, like five or so cards. No, it should be seven. And um, then you go around the table. No, it should be seven. And um, then you go around the table. Everyone takes their turn. In your turn, you draw one card. And then either you can play one card or draw, and draw a second card. And at the end of your turn, you draw up to... Uh, no, discard down to your hand limit. If you happen to have more than seven cards, you have to discard cards. And that's basically it. There is a lot more that happens because, of course, all the cards have different abilities and effects that happen at certain times during your turn. And um, so these get handled in between. And has uh, seven unicorns played in their stable or six unicorns if you play with seven uh, with six to eight players so it's a two to eight player game and um so yeah it's really easy to learn and um the important stands on your cards um maybe one small thing there are instant cards they have like a red exclamation mark on them those can be played at any time the most Leave prominent card. one is the nay card and um, which basically lets you say oh a uh, card and um, which basically lets you say oh uh, that card you just played nay you have to take it back and um, no not take it back uh, discard it uh, so no I don't like what you just did and um, and here we also get to the uh, and and um, and here we also get to the core problem with this game, which is the same problem we have with uh, Munchkin. Uh, it's really funny. It's funny to look at the cards. Uh, it's funny to read like the sometimes the little texts that are on them and them. And um, but you play, and at some point you realize someone is pulling ahead, and they have a really hard time to actually win because as soon as everyone notices they are pulling ahead of course they get <laughs> <And> hindered <laughs> so i played it with six players and i think after like three hours we stopped playing jesus <laughs> yeah that sounds horrible um not, yeah not and it like it, it was the fun the first cool unicorns yeah it was fun the first half to three quarter hour drag on and um, so, yeah, that. Uh, <laughs> and, 
and because uh, I, I I have th these feelings about the game, of course, when the next Kickstarter came, I got the two other versions of it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> chaos because I thought I really want to love this game and. Of course, surely they will learn from their mistakes. So I get these these different versions that are compatible to each other and then everything will be great. Only to realize, no, it's just more of the same. It's basically, I have the game three times now with like <laughs> one game evolving on the tree at iteration. You just got three uh, times a bad game. <laughs> yes, uh, uh, yes. But uh, uh, is the art fun? The art is great. And th th then, this is... then at least you got like a display piece. <laughs> yeah, and um, and now comes the really the... weird part. Because Let's go. in this mm -hmm. Kickstarter for the two additional versions of Unsafe Unicorns, they offered another game from them, Llamas Unleashed. Um, another card loves game. Llamas. Um, I, I, <laughs> I would like to, you know, just... Um, another card game, um, I, I, I would like to, you know, just shortly, how does this game work? It's a card game. You start by, you know, handing out cards and on your turn, you draw one card from the pile. Then either you play a card or draw another card and then you discard down to your hand limit. Notice that and then you discard down to your hand limit. Notice a similarity. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's something that I heard uh few times from this company because I think they are it's, it's the one that also did exploding kittens uh, here to slay I think <laughs> they they also made the bear game uh, bear yeah and and for here to slay I also heard someone say oh it's it's a bit the same than unstable unicorn but the uh, ambient and the uh, art will be a bit different so that's not a surprise on my yeah, side but Lamas Unleashed is There's a bet. basically the exact same game as Unstable Unicorns. And friends over and uh, they were like, oh yeah, let's play something. And ooh, what's that? Unstable Unicorns, that sounds funny. And I was like, ah, you know, if you if you want to play this game, let's play Lamas Unleashed. I haven't played it yet. Um, you know, just, you know, something different. And we had yeah, so much fun. Yeah, at least you might try a new game, uh, even if it's not as good. Good? Is that where the story is going? Yeah, it's it it was really fun. Lamas Unleashed was a lot of fun for us, and I tr really tried to figure out why because it is the same game. Just you know, swap out the unicorns and of course the um, narwhals because when you talk about unicorns, you also <laughs> <laughs> um, that's a tooth. Yes, <laughs> I know, but psh. <laughs> um, and in Llamas Unleashed, you have llamas, alpacas, and um, goats. And, um, but it's a lot more fun, simply, and I have a lot more fun because of the card names. Um, in Unstable Unicorns, um, I mean, th there is a lot of joke built in with card names and then looking at the picture, you know, for example, the annoying flying unicorn is this uh, unicorn with wings and that has like symbol unicorn is this uh, unicorn with wings and that has like symbols in its hand and uh, a horn and a, a you know the, these these horns with the ball on their end which you push and then it must <laughs> and uh, on on its horn and um so yeah it's 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 <laughs> and uh, on on its horn and um, so yeah, it's it's it really it really looks annoying. So, um, but in Llamas Unleashed, there is already a joke in the title of the card. For example, you have this this spell card that's called Download More Ram. This this spell card that's called Download More Ram. Yeah, that's my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> Which lets you get another Ram card. Um, yeah. Or. Um, in Unstable Unicorns, you have these snake cards. You have a lot of snake cards, which, of course, all snake cards. Snake cards. You have a lot of snake cards, which, of course, all snake cards do the same thing. In Llamas Unleashed, you have a lot of cards which do exactly that, but they all have different artwork and different names. One of them, for example, is Alpaca Your Bags. You know. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> that. That's a. <laughs> and <laughs> that. <laughs> That's a goat meal raising cookie. 
or, or the battering ram, which of course is a ram stripped into <laughs> like a construction. Yeah, it's there is so much more jokes in it, and it's so many times thought it's so funny, and we all laughed. So um, yeah, that's um, so. Even though I really like unicorns, if someone is interested in in one of these games. Um, I personally would recommend Get Llamas Unleashed. I found it a lot more fun. Analytical uh, uh, insight about that, there's also the fact that on uh, Llamas Unleashed, actually cards work only on a, on a god type, like on la they work only on llamas or work only on goats mm -hmm. or only on rams. The game tends to be less of a slog yeah it has more because, depth to it yeah. and also it's not like um with alpaca your back it only works on <laughs> alpacas yeah. so you can't cancel everything with it um reducing the chance that someone is short to this last step <laughs> yeah now, now i will say something outrageous so Bear with me. I, I will say this only because there's no fan today. So <laughs> uh, he, I am an uh, I'm an old player of Magic: The Gathering, meaning that I played actually in ninety three, four, five up until uh, ninety eight. So a lot of time ago. And uh, back then, the most horrible thing you could do to a Magic game was bring blue. Because if you played blue, you had only counter spell mana drain, uh, every which is like an eighth card on this game. Actually, uh, to fix this meta, they had a good idea because making car making eighth cards work only on a subset of the cards could really make the game enjoyable at the end. So that's pro. Uh, this is regardless of the fact that you might like uh, party card games, you might like Munchkin, you might like Runaway Leaders. Uh, actually, the idea of making the, uh, the, the counter spell equivalent only work on some condition, it's a winning idea. Only work on some condition, it's a winning idea. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> and um, I also want to talk shortly about the the company um in general <laughs> because um it, you mentioned it earlier um with um, as, um it, you mentioned it earlier um with um here to slay it's it's it really feels like they have this one idea on the unicorns and all their other games kind of build on this and put in some variation because i it's like I have some variation because I. It's like I, I really want to love their games because I really enjoy the artwork, um, but I have after Lamas Unleashed I didn't get any other game, uh, because when Here to Slay came on Kickstarter I was like oh my god it's so amazing and I backed it at first but I noticed okay how do you win by collecting like seven cards in front of you. <laughs> I know there is a, there is a different win strategy as well. So there is an, a, another option how you can win, and um, but it's like <laughs> I really felt like it, it's not really. And um, but I think they kind of with the recent games, um, the the two most recent games are Happy Little Dinosaurs and uh, Casting Shadows. Um, I actually have a T-shirt with the cover art of Happy, Happy Little Dinosaurs, and um, <laughs> I didn't get them simply because I don't like their business practices. Um, they use Kickstarter for most of their games, and I have never encountered another Kickstarter that uh, like is fueled so much by FOMO. And when you look at their Kickstarter pages, it's really one Kickstarter exclusive after another. And um, you have like the, the small card games in the end, which when you go all in cost like $200. Yeah, it's, I, that was actually the reason why I 
in the end backed out of here to stay and didn't want to give it a try because I felt like I don't want to support this. So, I mean, it's something everyone has a different view on that, but um, for me, if I try, I will buy it in retail. Um, no, th that's understandable. Uh, also, because uh, by what uh, you are telling, uh, they look like the games look a lot like palette swaps of the original idea. Yeah. As I said the last two; they really seem different. Um, so uh, yeah, and I think actually I have friends who uh, own Happy Little Dinosaur Source, so maybe. I will get to try it someday. <laughs> so, uh, will art is going to will art is going to retail? I, I think that uh, Unstable Unicorns was on retail in the end. Uh, I do believe. Um, I mean, they have their own web shop where you can buy their games, and hmm. um, I know uh, Unstable Unicorns is in retail here in Germany with like a German version. Unstable Unicorns is in retail in Germany with like a German version I think uh, here to slay I've seen in in my board game store um, so yeah I don't feel the need to back a Kickstarter from them to get the game need to back a Kickstarter from them to get the game you will get the game after the Kickstarter for like 25 yeah. euro dollars or so so <laughs> um, yeah, th there's actually a few retail offers for their game. Promise, if you like the game, you get the game at retail and you just skip the Kickstarter. Yeah. Yeah, great. That's solid advice, actually. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> <Don't>... <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, uh, Alessio, you wanted to, to talk about a game. Uh, I'm pretty sure that... Is it is it a dragon or is it a unicorn? I think it's a unicorn, the symbol of Highland. But I might uh, be wrong. So I, it would be a very uh, insensitive... Uh, <laughs> either dragon or unicorn, you wanted to talk about the High King of Highland. Uh, yeah, of course. Uh, I think that uh, the symbol of Ireland is the shamrock, so the three leaf clover, or the harp, possibly. But uh, anyway, uh, Brian Boru. He, and I have begun to think that uh, uh, when there's the name of Pierre Sylvester in a game box, uh, that is an implicit assurance of quality. <laughs> yeah, Pierre Sylvester basically is a designer who always manages to make games where every choice has a counterbalance, every choice counts, and actually Brian Boru, I King of Ireland, makes no exception to this. So, uh, historically talking, and uh, I'm working on eggshells here, Brian Boru has been I, I King of Ireland, Reuniti reuniting all the Irish clans, uh, fighting back uh, Viking. Reuniti reuniting all the Irish clans, uh, fighting back uh, Viking uh, Viking invaders, extending his own influence through Catholic monasteries and political marriages. Uh, he has become over the the centuries the classic larger than life uh, historical figure. Uh, centuries the classic larger than life uh, historical figure. Uh, who becomes, uh, by his own right, the staff of legend. So, uh, it is important, it is a touchy subject, uh, it, is, uh, it has been suggested for canonization as a saint, uh, I think uh, in tested for canonization as a saint, uh, I think uh, in Catholic Church, uh, I, I should know, but I don't know. So, uh, uh, this is enough dwelling on history for me, uh, let's just talk about the game, okay? Uh, Brian Boru the board game sets three to five players to emulate. Uh, Brian Boru the board game sets three to five players to emulate the deeds of Brian Boru, but by trying to extend their influence and control on uh, a map of Ireland, uh, which is uh, conveniently divided in eight regions, and each of these regions is divided in multiple cities. These regions is divided in multiple cities. 
and each city has a color which is uh, one of the three game's suits, which is red, yellow and blue. In the game, what you will be doing is vying for control of cities and, uh, and fighting back Vikings. You will occasionally leverage the Viking invasions to strike or damage other players' positions. You will arrange deals with the church and game monasteries which will give you extended control on the cities and the regions they are in. Practical advantages. Up to arranging a marriage with the Viking princess herself which will turn Vikings from enemies to allies, to allies for you only. And this is basically the theme of the game. You will do all of this with a simple map where you will place discs to represent your parts of a trick-taking game. Now, uh, this is important because this is an area control game with trick-taking as its main mechanism. This makes it very simple and fast, but extremely deep. You will play this game uh, is actually incredibly accurate. I played a five player game and two of these five players were first time players and the game lasted about two hours. You can teach it really fast. This is a, an extremely fast to play area control game. So how do you play it? Uh, this is extremely quick to explain. At the beginning of, of the game uh, all the playing cards are shuffled and divided equally among all players. And then you do a fast draft. How do you do the draft? Uh, you look at the card of, on your hands, you keep two draft, uh, you look at the card of, on your hands, you keep two, you choose two to keep, then you pass the other cards around, and you go on until one or no cards remain. And that's your deck for the entire game. After that, you decide to have control. After that, you decide to have control in one city in one region. It cannot be the same region for, for all players. And then you proceed to play the, uh, the, the end of cards you have in various tricks. Now, trick taking mechanism is simple card in a suit. The player leading is forced to play. Uh, to choose a city, a town he wants uh, on the map, he wants to use it as the contended city for this turn, the, acti the, act the active city for this turn, and then the after that all the other players uh, can uh, must play a card uh, of any suit of any value they want, and when everyone has played. The, uh, the one with the highest value in the suit, the trick-taking round. You do this for all cards in end, and uh, when, you, when every player is left with one card in end, that, the, that card is not played, it's discarded, and another uh, round, uh, you go to the upkeep phase, so you resolve taking you accumulate resources and progress through uh, tracks, in the game. Uh, this is the playing phase. After that there's an upkeep phase when you just resolve all the progress you did to gain victory points, advantages, uh, controls and stuff like that. The turn you repeat it for three to four turns depending on the number of players and then you count victory points. At the end of the game who has most victory point win. So uh, this is extremely easy, simple to play, but there's a lot of complexity of that. Uh, basically, uh, the play, like I said, when you do trick taking, the player with the highest value wins the trick. So uh, the the, tri the the cool part here is that each part, each card that you play has a top and the bottom side. In uh, each uh, side uh, there, i there is one or more actions. Uh, when you win the trick you always do the top action. When you lose the trick you always do one of the bottom actions. Uh, 
if you want to seize control of that city you have to win the trick because there's never uh, take control of the city as an action available in the bottom part of the card the top part of the card has always a, a way of controlling the city plus an added has always a, a way of controlling the city plus an added uh, bonus this bonus is uh, th the more powerful as the card you played as least value which is tricky but i repeat the least value which is tricky but i repeat the bonus you get is uh, if you win is uh, the least powerful when the card is highest so what does it mean in playing card uh, terms basically that if you manage to uh, win a trick with a low card you actually accomplished a big feat and for that you are rewarded if you won with a high card you actually have an expensive action which is basically weak is uh, with the bottom cards the bottom cards are us usually more utility so you will often want to uh, lose a trick because you want to play an utility action you have more choice because you have two or three options uh, to pursue in the bottom section of the card you will never get died of a city by the bottom action although if you are uh, have high influence with within the church you have uh, uh, some expensive action which allows you to take control of a city with a bottom section but we will talk about this later and the bottom cards are basically the same means it's the opposite so uh, the most powerful the card uh, is the most powerful the bonus is uh, the concept again is that if you manage to lose a trick with a high card you actually deserve some <laughs> respect because that's hard to do and the interest of the game this the key and all the fun of the trick taking you are playing area control on a real map using the most deceitful actions in a trick taking game you will try to win tricks against desperate odds with low cards or you will try to lose on par odds with low cards or you will try to lose on purpose with a high card or you will try to mislead your opponents about your real intentions to seize the big prize all while planning carefully because well uh, your last card in the end will never be played so you cannot afford that last card in the end will never be played so you cannot afford that the last card is a useful one because that gets discarded and yeah yeah that, that, that's exactly very cool because uh, if you think about it uh, that, that's exactly very cool because uh, if you think about it uh, the trick taking mechanism is very easy to read and you usually end up uh, uh, playing mechanically because in all trick taking games uh, there's a, a move which is always better than other uh, yeah. a move which is always better than other uh, yeah, I, I I'm I'm having a look at the um, at the, the the look of the game, and it's true that the, um, they are very simple icons on the card, and and it looks very readable in the in the way that it's laid out. Um, but I I had a, actually a quick question about the. Um, but I I had a, actually a quick question about the the game is uh, the art yeah. seems kind of um to put it into uh into nice words uh poor. Uh, is it is it uh, distracting uh, at all for the for the game that the, the game doesn't look very at the <laughs> first look uh, of it is that something that you've noticed uh, okay uh, this is a good question uh, about the distraction I don't know because uh, the first time I I actually look at the, uh, I, I used to uh, learn the game first and then teach to people because that's my roaming group. So uh, I learned the game uh, in advance. And when I learned the game, I was actually overwhelmed by the iconography. But it is true that uh, after I think uh, 
two times you play the cards the icons are basically the same and then it could be a bit of a wall to learn the icons the first time but once you uh, went through a round it comes uh, natural also because the game is uh, uh, conveniently divided into parts you always play all the tricks and with the tricks you accumulate you accumulate uh, progress in the marriage track uh, you accumulate coins and you fight vikings which are uh, uh, represented as tokens so you accumulate tokens and you accumulate everything so all you have to uh, take into account when you play trick taking is that you want to accumulate the most of what you want to pursue you uh, have an upkeep phase where you spend you resolve what you accumulated and this uh, this subdivision could seems uh, could seem just mechanical but actually helps you in not being distracted because uh, you know, uh, I need the three letters to advance on. The, uh, I need the three letters to advance on the marriage track as much as I want. That's a clear. Uh, that's a clear objective. So if you are wanting to do that, that turn, you will work toward that. And so you just you are just caring for uh, accumulating letter icons. The turn. Uh, I don't know. Accumulating letter icons. The turn. Uh, I don't know if the, if this helps, but uh, I can tell you that the game the games we play are usually pretty simple. Once you play the one turn, that's true. You have to play one turn. I think to to make everything resound. Uh, and I think to to make everything resound uh, correctly. Uh, and this is why uh, why this happens. This is because uh, you have an upkeep phase in the upkeep phase you do a few tasks which are always the same you check who is the one round and that one gets the marriage which is a bonus basically and it's resolved immediately then you like in obsession yeah like in obsession you get uh, of course uh, it works kind of like in obsession because that mechanism works with this game and actually a bit more interesting on the strategical part because it allows you to focus okay so you can have a long-term plan and I like this aspect of course yeah <laughs> the seems, player yeah it, it, it seems to be a very uh, a very fun game uh, did you mention right? it's three is three to five players right three to five player all right that, yeah that seems to be a pretty good game for a long evening with the with the family um, yeah, yeah. Actually, yeah. it is uh, uh, it is kind of uh, area control for a family. <laughs> I would call uh, like that. It's not ex uh, uh, there are popular family games with trick taking. So I if your family plays the crew, you can definitely play Brian Boru successfully. That's pretty great. Uh, do you, uh, how long does a, a game take uh, usually? Um... I I, yeah, I have not to touch that game specifically, so I'm uh, I have to. I, I think I think that you can say you can play a tiny player count with uh, a bit less than two hours. All right. Okay. Yeah, that seems to be a, a good uh, good amount of time for um, a proper um, area control game, um, and a, um, area control game. Um, and uh, I, have you tried to to play those with uh well your kids are probably a bit too young for this uh, i'm going to assume but um <laughs> i it, it seems to be quite accessible given the the simplicity of the icons and uh the strategy while you know uh current and uh the strategy while you know uh having depth is pretty straightforward um yeah uh, that's actually that's actually cool because the depth comes from the action of the other players because uh, it's rare that you will play a turn doing exactly it's rare that you will play a turn doing exactly what you want because you will lose a trick when you want to win you will lose control of a region because of that because you won't have enough cities or sa or you will do everything you want but there are vi vikings in this game uh, do everything you want but there are vi vikings in this game uh, if you don't get enough vikings token and you end up having the least amount of viking tokens the player with the most 
Vikings token will decide for you one city you will lose for you one city you will lose to the Vikings. So uh, there is, uh, like I said, this is a thing that Pierre Sylvester does magistrally. Uh, every action you do can be counterbalanced in some way. Unless you played, always have something to do to oppose uh, an apparently losing condition. You can always do something and up until the very end. Uh, I didn't have yet a game with a runaway leader because the last marriage is with the princess of Denmark, which will make Vikings allies. And that marriage has a superpower, which is uh, mm, a genius. Every town conquered by Vikings so far will be for you in one of two ways or you can even if that's not the case for you you can even discard it for immediate victory points so uh, you will play this game until the last turn there's no way you will feel hopeless at any time because there's always a way to play smart this is very important there's no runaway leader this is a strategy you uh, the best strategy will win uh, the best player will have a way to emerge, but the, the worst player will never feel so hopeless that the game is automatically lost. And that's this cool. very smart. Yeah, th you, that's you, important. Yeah, you, your games are usually uh, then quite tense uh, all, uh, all the way up to the end, right? Yeah, actually, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't say... I don't, I don't know if I can say if all my ga uh, that all my games were tense because at some point uh, that all my games were tense because at some point I ensured that the last turn went in a positive way. But it is true that I can uh, when I won I could never be sure of the victory until after the last turn. That's never be sure of the victory until after the last turn that's pretty because that's pretty fun it seems yeah. like a that's a pretty good game to to try and maybe i'll uh, i'll give it a go yeah um, of course is there uh, anyone else that that had uh, another question for for alessio i mean i when i i heard of a game and i looked at the box art first of all like this this art style does nothing for me <laughs> And yeah. um, <laughs> it's it, it kind of reminds me of this one Total War uh, video game. Um, <laughs> Rammer. <laughs> that also uses like a similar art style. And um, yeah, that, that does nothing for me. And then when I, you know, earlier looked at the game itself and like the components, it, it's, it's pretty bland, isn't it? Uh. I have a list of downsides here because uh, not everything is pure gold. So uh, artwork is definitely on top of this list because uh, the production value of the entire game is on par with Osprey games, which means usually pretty good. It's not over Osprey games as exactly what you want in a nice and cool way. You have wooden pieces, you have good cardboard, the, the, the card stock for the actual playing cards is not the best, but it is pretty much okay. You can play without sleeving if you want. I, and uh, But artwork is actually a hotly debated topic. Uh, the artwork is by Derdre de Barra, which is an, uh, an Irish artist who happened to actually have drawn a comic book about Brian Boru before the game was published so she was an obvious she has a peculiar trait a, a line work on the cards and uh, she chose to use co a, a, a colored pencil style for the main illustrations and this kind of style is clashing a bit with the recipe and the uh, actual decoration of the cards, the, the Celtic motifs on the cards and the rest, and the fact that it uses silver trimming 
uh, around the game, it's a bit clashing with, uh, uh, with the actual artwork of the cards, and that makes it not bad or inappropriate, but a bit dissonating. So, uh, actually, I suggest everyone to have a look at it if artwork and presentation is a deal breaker for your games. So this is actually the, 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 the thing I for your games. So this is actually the, 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 the thing I heard the most uh, and the, the most common complaint ab about uh, my friends when we had the game night. So this is important to know. There are, uh, I think, three other points which should be... There are, uh, I think, three other points which should be considered which could be considered downsides, which are, first, this is a trick-taking, exceptionally well done and expanded with a board, which is uh, mind-blowing, this is beautiful, I would a bit later, but it's still trick-taking. This means that uh, if you don't want to read the game state correctly or try to interpret your opponent's intentions, you shouldn't play this game because it has the mechanics of trick-taking. Isn't for you, that's not a lot you can do because it's the main mechanic without resources are assigned and the resource assignment is important in this game. One. The second thing is the table state can be read easily. Game and it's very interesting but it's not the best area control game because of this so if you are looking for an area control game there are better options Ank gods of egypt for example is the best option i so if you are going just for oh, no i want the best area control i i can find this is not the best, this is a very good one, this is a fast one, this is a one a game which uses trick-taking uh, on a board which is uh, pretty much unheard of, but this is not the best for area majority. If you Finally, this is endemic actually to the game, so this is probably more important than the other two, is that you can be outdrafted. Uh, since this is very rare, but it happened, that uh, uh, if you draft with one strategy in mind and you end up playing with a deck you manage to draft that way you could be shut down pretty soon because the game needs a bit of adaptation I have to say that of taking two and passing over is uh, pretty good in avoiding this but there there are uh, actions like the church actions which allow you to seize control of uh, uh, cities when you are not winning the trick which if e if every other player except one find to discard them during draft there, there will be one player with all the charge actions and that player will probably win the game because you have been outdrafted. Again, it depends a bit on in the game because you have been outdrafted. Again, it depends a bit on how smart you and the other players are, but you can be outdrafted, which is pretty, pretty uh, worrisome if it happens. That said, the game is some if it happens. That said, the game is beautiful. It's my recommendation because I also uh, I always had a lot of fun with it. It's a last year game, but uh, we still play it regularly, even if we have Ank God of Egypt, of Egypt, also because Ank to bring to the table with the extended family. So it's a recommendation. About this, I have to note that uh, trick-taking with a board is uh, a, a, a thing so novel that uh, this is what uh, Call World is trying to do now with Ark's game. Uh, just by judging from the mechanical standpoint and from the fun of a game, 
I can say that Brian Boru is more fun than Arx and Cold World is a is a very popular designer. So we'll have uh, to we'll have to look at we'll have to look at mm. what uh, what he does next uh, in his game because yes, that sound that does sounds very interesting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> now Arx has a lot uh, has a lot more going for it. For example, there's a campaign mod. The game is still being developed, so it will end up being an exceptionally good game probably. And developed, so it will end up being an exceptionally good game probably. And we'll cover it when it's time. But I have to say, Brian Boru is very successful in what it does. On that note, it's probably a good idea to move on to a more fantastical topic. Uh, Audrey, you've played Iron Trespass Legacy, right? No! Uh, Audrey, you've played Iron Trespass Legacy, right? No! No? Oh. Oh, I am on, uh, wrong... on hands, my bad. Wrong game, wrong game, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes, it's Aeon's End Legacy that I wanted to talk about. Uh, yes, because and then that I was, uh, then that I had finishing it. So yeah, now is the time to talk about it. Aeon's End Legacy. So I'm not going to uh, re-explain uh, exactly how Aeon's End play because we went over this in episode 28. So if you haven't heard episode 28 and want to know more about it, I was ready. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, uh, Aeon's End Legacy, it's a bigger box. Uh, it's like between one and a half and two uh, regular Aeon's End boxes. And it contains all the campaign um, that is played. Uh, I heard since then that there is a legacy that is being delivered currently. And there is the Kickstarter for um, some other Aeon's End thing uh, running, uh, running right now. It's a bit like the Unstable games. They keep coming. They keep being very close to the same. But at least there is no pretense to disguise it under a change of <laughs> design. You know that, yeah, it's guys it under a change of <laughs> design. You know that, yeah, it's an Aeon's End. It's a different Nemesis. It's a different mage. It's uh, different spells, etc etc but you know it you are warned <laughs> so and then legacy uh and then legacy is a game with uh several chapters like most legacy games it's a bit like uh the pandemic uh, leg like most legacy games it's a bit like uh the pandemic uh, legacy i talked uh, about the uh season zero uh, a few quite early in the podcast history um, where you have so chapters and you can play the chapter twice uh, if you failed it and you get a bonus uh, kind of get a bonus uh, kind of for the second time um, the main things uh, with legacy games in general and that Aeon's End Legacy uh, has is that rules will be added progressively so if you are already an Aeon's End uh, player you will start with less uh, player you will start with less rules than you are used to like uh, at the instance there is no rule for when a player dies because you can't well dies uh loses all the uh, health points during a chapter because you can't lose a player for the first chapter or you you'd have to make it on purpose by yourself in a let's say rules problem so i would not advise to do it anyway um and so you will have these uh, stickers that you will add to the rule book uh, progressively uh as you will customize your mage because when you start the first chapter you get a mage or you have four uh, mage accounts uh side so uh, it's up to you to decide if you want to play a girl or a boy or more women or men that's always cool to have uh, different options for for each character i think that's so uh... And, and I'm always yeah, it... I'm always happy whenever a game uses double-sided uh, content. Yeah, it's very simple. Add, add, add the anything else on uh, the, the board. But then at some point you will customize their breaches, uh, you will customize their spell, they will get a weapon, they will get a second weapon. Uh, well, it, it's equipment more than weapon. Uh, you, will, you will customize just everything on the mage uh, across the different thing on the mage. Uh, across the different chapters. So that's super cool. Uh, you might find, however, that uh, some of the options could seem cool, 
but when trying them don't really work uh, we had that kind of issue at some point and we decided oh let's just crap and we decided oh let's just grab more stickers anyway we are playing just two out of four mages so there are some options that we are not using so let's uh kind of reset our mages and change them and uh, it helped us uh, a lot and us to get a feel and everything um, same way for the starting gear uh, same way for the starting gear uh, each character has a card uh, again it's double sided with uh, the guy on one side and the girl on the other side and you can uh, customize this starting card it can be a spell it can be a gem it can be uh, it can become at some point with a second feature a spell that still give you mana like a gem uh, you can def them. Uh, you can definitely customize that as well. So you really have lots of customization, and one thing that had uh, to be noted is that the mages that you end up at the end of the Earns and Legacy campaign are generally slightly more powerful than the ones that you can get in a reg that you can get in a regular Earns and Box, which uh, can lead to some. I will not say exactly imbalance because uh, you can still play with them, uh, they are not completely over overpowered, but let's say it can let give you a little booster to tackle uh, the more difficult nemesis. With 1 to 10 can be handy at some points, so yeah, wh why not have uh, more powerful mages and that you know how to use, how to play because you've uh, used them over all the chapters and making them more complex. Uh, Progressively, I think that's a very good choice, and I don't think that taking uh, regular stuff, as in any Eon Zen uh, game, which is more spells, uh, lots of different spells, different nemesis, which are all uh, tied to the story, so they're all in some way or some other way have an impact on the story that you, you play during the legacy campaign. Uh, like some can for later, uh, some are just really, really, really related to the story so much that they are more of an intro to the game, uh, etc. And they will have, uh, all have something, again, personal, something that makes them unique, like in every single Aeon Zen uh, game anyway. As well, their game anyway. As well, there is a story. Um, the story is not in a booklet uh, compared to many legacy games. It's a deck of cards, uh, and when you have finished a chapter, you have to read the card number uh, A25. Uh, and if you have failed the chapter, you will have to also read the chapter. You will have to also read the following card. And if you haven't failed uh, the chapter, you just skip one card. So there is not really a big, let's say, law impact on failing a chapter uh it's really just yeah do you read with this card or not does a mage um, a high mage uh, give you a high mage uh, give you more pointers or do they scold you or do they just yeah okay <laughs> so the, the story is not really the reason to to play the game it's really mostly yeah leveling up your mage facing off new nemesis uh which in a way the facing of the nemesis is still brought by any uh, regular urns and uh, uh, regular urns and uh, bugs so that's that's not the main interest uh, in my opinion yeah, the, the customizing is really the, the biggest interest as well uh, as in any Eon Zen game, you still get new counts, so new relics, new gems, new spells, and they new gems, new spells, and they again all uh, are new, different from each other. Uh, generally, um, they. Of quite a few of them use uh, a certain type of token, which is introduced by the Legacy game. There are tokens like Radiance token or something like that. Uh, I'm uh, browsing my uh, I'm uh, browsing my rulebook to find their names. Uh, Pulsation in French, um, and these tokens are used by some other cards. Like some um, relics will make you gain some, and some spells will say, "Oh, you can spend uh, some extra uh, pulsation tokens when you play this uh, spell to deal extra damage or to recover a card or what or to recover a card or whatever." So uh, I think that in each core box of Eon Z you can find some kind of mechanic like this one, which is a bit unique to the box, and uh, we've half of the spell relics and gems card which make some combo together but it, it uh, gains some tokens but can also make you spend so you can't always uh, let's say uh, match all the cards together but 
you can match um, more than half of a card together with another version of the game and you won't face any issues. Uh, when you have finished uh, the campaign, you uh, all the content. Like what you, what you do with the mages, uh, how you do with the turn order uh, card deck, uh, how you do with player cards, uh, everything, how you how you do with the nemesis, etc, etc. So you can definitely uh, combine just everything and I think that's the thing, you can put everything together in a box and just be done. Hopefully you take out the <laughs> thermoformed insert because that one is losing so much <laughs> space and yeah. That's always good with a, a legacy game when you can just repackage it and, and replay it from the well without having to destroy cards or to to well, without having to destroy cards or to to you know lose the, the original the game that it's still a functional game at the end. Yeah, um, exactly. And uh, yeah. since that was let's say the logic of Ian's end from the start, uh, it's not a surprise that it goes on here. Yeah, definitely. In my opinion. Um, and I think that Ian goes on here. Yeah, definitely. In my opinion. Um, and, and I think that Ian's end, the the base game, suits itself pretty well for legacy, um, for legacy one, uh, because it's already like a fight against different nemesis, which with different um, different characters that all have. I think that in the base game they are the, they are the different characters that all have. I think that in the base game they are the, they are the backstory from the start, or maybe I misremember. Um, but it's least... like one page which says, "Oh, revolt is the city, blah blah yeah, blah, yeah, blah, still, blah." Yeah, it's still, it's still, it's it still was a small like story con uh, content that um, that feels right to be a story con uh, content that um, that feels right to be uh, to be expanded. Uh, speaking of, uh, how did you did you find the the story like the the actual um, storytelling aspect of the legacy of the legacy game? Honestly, I. Uh, uh... I think I said that. Uh, <laughs> I didn't really care because care because yeah, it was the cards, and if you miss the scenario, you have one extra card to read or one ex one less card to read. Uh, it wasn't really impactful, to be honest. Uh, so yeah, that was not really a big part of the game for me. Um, yeah, it was more customizing the maze. It's that some cards have an evolution mechanic, and that was great. Um, some cards, when you uh, play them, uh, you put a sticker on them at some... There is a spot to say... Uh, with, with the shape of a s specific type of sticker, and when you uh, activate the card, you put the sticker on it. Well, when you draw the card, um, uh, the card have, has to evolve. And then you have the pocket of evolution cards. You... Um, pick the one that which is called because it's like uh, when this card evolves please uh, go and pick uh, evoluted card number uh, 57 let's say. and so you go you pick that card and so you go you pick that card and it's an evolved version like you get uh, uh, like the, the larvae and then you get the, the insects they are all thematically tied they uh, all have the same uh, let's say concept and um, and um, they, they get stronger actually. So uh, there is that little impact which says that if you have trouble fighting an nemesis or if you have trouble at some point in the story because you picked uh, a combo for your mage which doesn't really work or stuff like that, you're going to doesn't really work or stuff like that, you're going to probably have troubles fighting. Um, the, the nemesis because the nemesis cards will get harder and harder so there is that kind of uh, a, a time run uh, kind of a bit uh, and I think that's really interesting because you, you know that oh, oh I still have because you, you know that oh, oh I still have this card which is somewhere in the deck and that one got evolved and oh <laughs> so uh, I have just one question because I like Eon's end, and it was already a uh, pretty cost end, and it was already a uh, pretty cost customizable. Basically, mm -hmm. this one is Eon's end, Eon's end with a story progression, customizable equip equipment from the start with the progression of the characters, and evolving cards which look very cool, right? Not not a card every three or four cards. Okay, but uh, this is it. So it's basically uh, a 
pump it up evolving version of the, of the basic uh, concept of Eon Sand, right? I would say evolved and at the same time simpler because the first two or three chapters have so many rules less that you, that it's a great point. Like if you have a, if you are an experienced player of Eon Sand, you love the game and you want to show it to your friends, to your family, and you make them play this one and you show them and ah. Yeah, that, that, that's actually that's actually what I was thinking. Do you think that this is uh, to be recommended? Uh, <laughs> one million uh, dollar uh, question. <laughs> no, to be honest, I think that it's better to know regular and then first. Okay, so Not get, get both. Yeah, but it's more due to the fact that some combos don't work, and if you know a bit more of the game, you will be able to do something that will not uh, will handicap make more you sense. at some yeah. point, that will make more sense. So yeah, I think that having one play, you need to have at least one player that knows the game, in, in, my, in my opinion. Okay. The... Small note, uh, as we talked about the graphics, uh, let's say, about with Brian Boru, uh, Eon Zen Legacy is still uh, quite a simple art style as all the Eon Zen, that's the same, that's not changing, and even in the running Kickstarter that I checked, it's still the same, so that's, um, yeah, but you know, generally... But you know, generally, you know it when you know Eon Zen, so that's and it's worn on the box, I would say. Um, so that's not a problem. However, what was really a problem and that I encountered uh, we was quality control uh, with the French version. I don't know uh, if that problem uh, ar if that problem uh, arose uh, arose uh, in the English versions or not. But I had some uh, stickers, quality control, where the stickers didn't. Um, the windows, I couldn't open them properly from the, the I don't know how it's called, but the, the sticker book, uh, because it's all a uh, book, uh, because it's all uh, stuck inside at the beginning and you have to open it and it, it was a bit annoying and there were not all the letters written properly around the stickers, so you opened it and it said uh, open window 8 and in window 8 you have three or four sticker planes and it says oh put a uh, sticker U in the U letter of the U in the U letter of the rule book and you're like uh, I don't know where it's exactly but with the shape of the sticker and the size and uh, when you know the <laughs> rules of Aeon Zen, when you know the rules of Aeon Zen, you know that uh, yeah that's where a player death goes so I can put it in here but that was a bit of a problem uh, I think that was a bit of a problem. Uh, I think it was just one sticker sheet that had this issue, however, but I reported it to uh, Madago, which is a French uh, editor, and I said, hey, by the way, there's this issue, and they told me, oh, thank you very much for saying that and for being nice while saying that. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> That's okay. Small note, uh, to be honest, but still I think that uh, yeah, it's good to have it in mind uh, when buying a French version. Yeah, it, it, it has been translated in a lot of languages anyway, so I think... That yeah, Legacy, uh, I'm not sure any wave has been translated since then, but I have to uh, look at that, and now that I have a new job, I have a few purchases uh, of Aeons and Plan and also Spirit Island and Expansion, but that's another topic. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, I want at some point to complete my uh, Zen expansion, and I will probably look if there is a an insert that fits the Aeon Zen Legacy box, because that's the bigger Aeon Zen box that I have, and that would be more convenient to store everything in the big box more than uh, in the small core box. Well, oh. smaller relatively. In the small core box. Well, oh. smaller relatively. Okay, so I, I see that the box goes for uh, 80 euros, basically, about... Yeah, 80 I, I, ar around 80. So it's pretty normal for the prices after pandemic. So it's a normal big box game for the prices after pandemic. So it's a normal big box game. Yeah, and, and I would say that compared to Pandemic Season 0, which was close to the same price, you get more value out of Aeon Zen Legacy due to all the cards, all the mages, all, all the nemesis, except maybe the very first one, uh, being replayable. And, uh, if you want more difficulty, do these rules uh, 
so yeah you definitely have more mileage than with a um uh, i want to say zombie side but i have no idea why pandemic <laughs> legacy <laughs> okay uh there's also a reset pa reset uh, pandemic legacy uh, yep but, 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 but also if you don't really uh if you just want to uh, make more mage combos and just have more <laughs> mages that can be an option that's great and one last question because i'm genuinely curious about this uh, thing i love of pandemic legacy games and i loved in clank legacy uh, was that was the fact that uh, in the middle of a combat something triggered and uh, the rules changed uh, all of a sudden does this happen in a Eon Sand Legacy or is uh, more linear? Does this happen in a Eon Sand Legacy or is uh, more linear? Um, no, the, the rules, uh, the evolution of the rules happen between uh, chapters. However, uh, cards evolving uh, happens uh, during the fights. So you can say, oh, you're pulling this one, but yeah, it's during the fights. So you can say, oh, you're pulling this one, but yeah, it's you have uh, this alternative so it's not exactly rules that change but some uh, let's say some components do change yeah okay that means just that you are focused on the game you're playing okay yes <laughs> I mean yeah Ion's End is like my favorite game and I was very 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 I could have many more very but I'm going to stay there uh, happy to show it to my sister and to have a two-player games uh, a few weeks ago um, yeah and I, I, I yeah are there any more questions from Alexis and Kara maybe um, not really I've, I've really enjoyed uh, Aeon's and uh, the base game so uh, I wasn't planning to buy it uh, specifically because I was one I, I wanted to to try to get legacy instead because I thought that might be a more interesting one to have at the table but um, I, I definitely uh, just feel like I, I need to grab it more now <laughs> yeah it, it's a bit a different experience so depending on what you want you can pick one or the other however I will say that even after the campaign uh, in legacy you have more even after the campaign uh, in Legacy, you have more Nemesis uh, than in a regular core box where you have, I think, four maybe. Uh, in the Legacy, it's uh, a bit more. I won't say the exact number because it's a spoiler territory. Uh, but yeah, you do have a bit more uh, Nemesis in the uh, Nemesis in the Legacy box. So if you are considering, let's say, longer playtime, let's say for the price it's even to pick one or the other and that means that we have uh, gone over all of the topics today uh, thank you for listening to the last ND you can catch us on ND on Twitter or subscribe to your preferred podcast app so it's a farewell from Audrey bye bye Alessio bye bye Cara Auf Wiederhören myself uh, goodbye, and remember that the second E in Standy is for 